enjoying our family service here in the robot factory and uh, we've been enjoying seeing the delights of our employees and um, but in audacious kids we are very excited that God didn't make us like robots uh, robots are made in a factory I mean it's pretty much lifelike exactly like this scene right here uh, and they have a conveyor belt where things come on and all things go together and they're all the same and you have the arms on and move it along and it's all the same. But when God made the universe, he made the earth not to fill it with robots, but to fill it with you and me. And he actually thought, you know what, I don't want robots that have to do as they're told. I want a relationship, a friendship. And uh, that's exciting news. That we don't all have to be the same. In fact, the Bible says in Psalms 139 and that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. As in, we were made by God on purpose and not to squeeze a load of humans out of a sausage factory. But actually, he made you on purpose and he made you who you are. And uh, he made each one of us different. Where we look at it in Audacious Kids all the time, and we've got, he knows the numbers of hairs on our head. Uh, we've got our own unique foot, uh, footprint, fingerprint, eye print. Uh, we're all unique. And uh, that is fantastic. However, sometimes feeling unique and different feels a little bit rubbish. Now, let me uh, come back, because that sounded like the wrong thing to say, didn't it? We all know that uniqueness is good, and we're all made individual, but for me sometimes, when I feel different to everyone else, I can feel a little bit embarrassed, or a little bit self-conscious, or sometimes I just want to fit in. Like when I was a child, there were some things about me that were very different. And, now don't laugh, when I was seven or eight, I had a very large head. <laughs> no, when I say very large head, I mean like really large. I mean like this size now, this head, on a seven-year-old body. I've basically been working on the past 30 years to let my body grow and fit the size of my head. And um, it was really embarrassing to have a big head. You know those tiny little uh, dolls that have huge heads that wobble around on people's dashboard? That was me at school sports day, running around trying to support this huge head. <laughs> and um, we had something at our church growing up that my mom and dad run, which was amazing, called Campaigners. Anybody ever heard of Campaigners? One or two, slowly. Um, it was kind of like Cubs and Scouts and Brownies and all that, but a church version. It was really good, and he had all the uniforms and the badges. I've got a little picture that is not actually me, but you get the vibe, where you get a badge. That guy at the back is polishing his shoes to get a badge. And this gentleman is getting the ironing your towel badge. Very famous badge, very well sought after. Uh, and his uh, uniform in there is a Juno's uniform. That was the age group. You get a little uh, blue hat like this that you wear as Juno's uniform. Yes. <laughs> Not quite fitting now, just as it didn't quite fit then. And so it was a little bit embarrassing because we had to send away for the extra, extra large Juno's hat. It was like special order, get it in, and uh, I had to wait, I had to do a parade with a naked head. <sighs> so embarrassing. Everyone else had their hats on. I was still waiting for my special order one. And then when it came, still too small. <laughs> and um, so yes, my mother had to get one specially made to fit such, it's because there was so much brains in there. That's what it is, very, very clever. And I uh, had to get it specially made. But I found it really embarrassing. Like, I was just, I did not want to be unique at that moment. I did not want to be different. I just wanted to have a normal size head like everybody else. It's hard work carrying around such a big head all day. 
And um, I knew that I was different, I knew that I was unique, but I did not want to be. And I uh, kind of felt a little bit different. Uh, at the same time, I think what saved me from years of therapy was a TV show that actually made me feel a little bit better. It was a TV show called The Raggy Dolls. Anybody ever heard of The Raggy Dolls? Oh, I get a witness, there's one or two. And uh, it was amazing. Here they are, this is The Raggy Dolls. Now the TV show was set in a toy factory. Just like this, they had a huge conveyor belt that would be churning out the toys and then every now and again, the conveyor belt would stop and a claw would come down and find a defective toy, a toy that had not been made correct. Um, there was a princess who was a raggy doll, uh, but instead of having a princess dress, all her dress was full of rags, and she was the ultimate raggy doll. Uh, and she's on the end there on the left. Um, then you've got uh, back to front, who's next to her. So he's the guy with the dungarees on, whose head was on backwards, so he had to walk backwards into everything. He was my favorite. And then that little orange kind of bean bag uh, was called Sad Sack. And um, yeah, he was, he was uh, a little bit grumpy. Um, I, can you do the theme tune? Go on, do it for me. I think you get the words this time so we can actually sing along with it because the words are awesome. It was kind of like my theme tune to year four. It was, uh, it was amazing. Go on, go for it. See if we can sing along with it. Oh, come on, guys. Just to be whoever you are is no disgrace. Don't be scared if you don't fit in. Look who's in the reject bin. It's the raggy dolls. Raggy dolls. Raggy dolls. Dolls like you and me. It's the raggy dolls. Raggy dolls. Raggy dolls. Thank you so much. You've just fulfilled a 30-year dream, being able to perform the Raggy Doll song. Mm. I love the Raggy Dolls though, and not just because of a really catchy theme tune, but it was amazing. These dolls were literally thrown into a big orange bin called the Reject Bin. I mean, it couldn't have been more rude and non-PC to put them in the reject bin because they were different. Um, but they were faulty, they, they weren't made correct. But the adventures of the Raggy Dolls meant that they were the ones who actually saved the day. There would be a dilemma, someone was trying to shut the factory down, or it was gonna burn down, or something was going on, and instead of all the good toys winning, it was the rejects that actually saved the day. And uh, I loved that, me and my big head would nod along and think it was awesome. And it reminds me of my favorite Bible story in the whole of the world. And uh, I want to share it with you today. Uh, it was actually about a reject, just like one of the raggy dolls, uh, about a young man called Ehud. I'm going to welcome Ehud to the stage, please. Come on down, Ehud. I know what you're thinking already, he doesn't look like a reject, he looks like a fine, handsome, brave, strong, mighty warrior, and modest as well, and um, he was amazing. Um, now the thing that made Ehud a reject was that he was left-handed. Is there anybody left-handed in the room today? Wave your hand, you can tell they've got pen smudged all over this side of the hand, so you'll be able to see it. And um, I know being left-handed today is not much of a big deal. You get your own pair of scissors at school. Uh, other such special left-handed tools, such as the weird pencil that we've got up there. And uh, you can actually get a left-handed IKEA spanner as well, which is really good. And, um, oh, unless you like Paul Garner, who kind of hooks his arm around and tries to write in his armpit so that he doesn't actually smudge anything when he's writing, which is... A sight to behold, you should uh, check it out. 
But in the Bible times, when Ehud was around, being left-handed was a no-no. It was kind of like, you are not a real person if you are left-handed. And uh, the problem was, Ehud grew up wanting to be a soldier, a brave, mighty warrior like he'd heard of the warriors of the past. And uh, that's all he wanted to be when he grew up, and he practiced, and he trained, and he'd run laps around the room every day just to get in shape. He'd do 20 press-ups every morning, and that would be great. And uh, he would be trained and ready to go. But when it came to enrollment day, to join the army, they would say, oh, I'm sorry, you can only be a soldier if you use your right hand. And so they would put the sword in his right hand, and, uh, and they would want him to be the soldier ready, but he couldn't do it with his right hand. It's like, nah, I can only do it with my left hand. This is where my skill is. If you give me the right hand, I, I, I can't do it. I don't know if you've ever tried to throw something with your wrong hand, with your left hand, you throw it with your right hand. It just, your whole body is used to working a certain way. I'm going to attempt this again. I'm going to throw this bottle top to Cheryl, right there. This is going to land for you, okay? I'm going to throw this as hard as I can, Cheryl. I'm going to get it right to you. You ready to catch it? It just feels wrong already. Just even do, okay. Oh, nearly. As you can see, using your wrong arm, your whole body just doesn't, doesn't work that way. And Ehud tried as much as he could. But unfortunately, he was rejected from the army. It's worse than that. It was his childhood dream. Yeah. And they said, no, you're no good here. Right-handed soldiers only. And that was kind of the end of Ehud's story. And it was pretty sad. However, the right-handed soldiers went on to carry on and unfortunately disobeyed God and ended up losing in battle and got taken over by the Moabites. And so they were conquered and in slavery to the Moabites and to a really bad king called King Eglon. Everybody say Eglon. Eglon. This is King Eglon. Now, I am not being rude, okay? This is what the Bible says. The Bible says King Eglon was a very fat man. <laughs> and he was very mean. But he actually reigned over the Israelites for 18 years. Go and sit on your throne, meanie. I just need to check he's still breathing. Do you want to scoot back a bit so you can breathe? <sighs> King Eglon, a very fat man. Now, as I said, King Eglon was a meanie. He was not kind to the Israelites. He had beaten them. Oops. Hello? And um, there's nothing that the Israelites could do. They had lost until God decided to use Ehud, the left-handed reject, to save the day. It's pretty awesome. This is what he decided to do. He decided that he was going to take a present a tribute, the Bible says, to King Eglon. There it is. And um, on his way, it, the Bible says very clearly that he strapped his sword to his right leg. Let me just uh, get that on there. Hide that under there. Very good, no one will know that. He strapped his sword to the right leg. The Bible specifies it's his right leg. 
and he went into the throne room to take his tribute to King Eglon. Are you right up there? Awesome. <laughs> Come on, Ehud. He went to the throne room. At the throne room door, he was stopped by the soldiers and the bodyguards. They're like, oh, not anybody can just come in and see the king. Let me check and make sure that you haven't got any weapons. But if you remember, back in the Bible times, the soldiers were only ever right-handed, so it meant they would only ever carry a sword on their left leg. So the soldiers were like, ha-ha, look, left leg, no sword, this guy is safe. And uh, he was allowed to go in uh, and visit the king. Let me just make him decent. <laughs> and gave him the tribute. That might help keep your belly under control. <laughs> oh, I can see your face now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> just keep your hand on it, Seb. He gave him the gift and turned to leave the throne room. But right at the last minute, he said, oh, I forgot, sorry. I've got a message, a secret message for the king. And so all the other soldiers were sent out. It was a secret message. He sent out the soldiers. He sent out the bodyguards. And they were like, it's fine. We've already checked him. He hasn't got any weapons. Uh, this should be fine. And so Ehud... <laughs> Remember, he had a weapon on his right leg, so he took with his left hand, drew his sword that nobody was expecting, and thrust the sword conveniently into the king's belly. Now, please don't tell me off. This is actually what the Bible says. He shoved the sword so far into his belly that the fat closed up over the handle. <laughs> and um, as you can imagine, King Eglon was now dead. Ehud was quite pleased about this, wasn't he? Yes. And so Ehud made his way out of the throne room, closed the doors behind him, and the bodyguards that were waiting outside, Ehud was very clever. He said, you may not want to go in there. The king is relieving himself. Which basically means the king was on the toilet, doing a number two. And um, it was, as you can imagine, I don't know if you have ever experienced it, if your dads take too long in the bathroom, and after you've been in there, you want to give it a good five or ten minutes before you even go in the room. Well, the bodyguards were like that. They were like, if he's doing one of those, uh, let's go get a brew and have a game of noughts and crosses because uh, you do not want to go in there anytime soon. And whilst they were waiting for the room, Ehud managed to escape without anybody even questioning what he'd done. It says he went up to the hills, he gathered the Israelite army, and Ehud, the left-handed reject, was actually the hero... And it says, he led the army and wiped out 10,000 of the Moabites, and they were all gone. And Israel was in peace for the next so many years. And it was amazing. Ehud the reject was the hero. I want to give my volunteers a round of applause. Thank you, Nathaniel. Up you go. Let's try and get him off if we can. Good job, buddy. Off you go. This is why it's one of my favorite stories. Not because it's gross and it's got blood and guts. Not because it's got a genuine toilet joke in the Bible. I love it. But actually because Ehud was the reject. Ehud was the one that wasn't good enough to be in the army, and yet that's the person that God used to save him which is amazing, and I love that. Imagine if Ehud would have quit. Imagine if Ehud would have thought, oh, sack this soldier stuff, 
if I can't do it, then I'm going to go and be a tailor or something else. Or pretended to be right-handed and struggled in the army. But actually, the very thing that he thought disqualified him is actually the thing that God used to save the day. And that is amazing. And that gives me solace. That helps me out. Me and my large head. Look at it now. Fitting perfectly on my manly frame. <laughs> and um, I couldn't really have quit having a large head, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and actually, what we want to learn from this story, as we're going back to school, school starts this week, my little Liberty is four years old. She's starting reception for the first time. All three of my children are going to be in school. It's amazing. But every single one of you, from those starting reception to those um, starting a new high school, starting a new college, university, or even if you're starting a new job, or even if you're going back to work, just like you did on Friday, actually, God wants us to be different on purpose. Let's not hide who God has made us to be, thinking that will help us fit in better. Let's not pretend to be just like the people in our class. And yet, in fact, some of us adults are going, yeah, that's a good, it's a good idea for the children not to pretend. And yet, we are twice as bad when it comes to the office, when it comes to the school playground with the other parents, trying to pretend to be a certain way or have things figured out or pretend that you like what they like when you don't even know what they're talking about. And um, you don't want to feel different, and yet actually God has made you different on purpose. And in fact, the thing that makes you different is probably what God wants to use for his glory to see his kingdom come and actually see people one for Jesus. In Ephesians, they put it in a little different way. If you could just put that verse up for me. Um, explains being different and unique, but slightly different. It says, for we are God's handiwork. We are unique. We're created. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. As in, God has a plan for our next year, for our new class, for our new job, for our next week at work. God has a plan, and he's actually made you unique, crafted you, his handiwork, ready for the adventure that is in front of us. What would it look like in our schools if we actually embraced who we are instead of pretending to be someone else and actually lived on purpose the plan that God has prepared in advance for us? What would our workplace look like? What would it be like? What would the people think? Actually, the key to your promotion or getting the change in work that you want is not trying to be someone else. It's actually embracing who God has made you to be. And if we can do that, then we can actually work out the plans that God has for us.